We are going to continue on with our study of the Baptist distinctives. If you were able to grab a sheet of paper and that can aid you please feel free to take it Uh, just a reminder of where we have been again this is not things that baptists only believe and no one else in christendom has ever considered these thoughts not at all but if you were to ask what generally a baptist does believe it is going to be these things first of all we looked at biblical authority god's word is the establishment of everything that we do believe think say and hold to it has to come from the scriptures we do believe in the autonomy of the local church made up of believers under the lordship and headship of King Jesus. We do believe that we as believers have a role as priests before God. And we talked about the various aspects that are involved in that role of being priests and ongoing role that we have in our world. Last week, we looked at the two ordinances of uh, baptism by immersion and the Lord's Supper. Again, those are not things that impart grace to us. Those are things that we do by way of obedience and a mechanism to remember what the Lord has called us to and what he has done for us and through us. And today we have the opportunity of looking at the next distinctive, which is one that may not be as self-evident. In fact, I really enjoyed studying this out because this is something that when when we get into it, it's going to make a lot of sense. But having it just put up on a screen, it's something that isn't as evident for us. Individual soul liberty. Well, breaking down each of those three words, we understand that we're going to be talking about individuals this evening. We believe that each individual is created with a soul. That is the true you. Um, That will live forever throughout eternity in one of two places, our Bible tells us. And that soul um, we're going to talk about is not perfect. That soul is marred by sin. But there is still an aspect of liberty that that soul engages and operates from. And we're going to unpack this a little bit more. But again, this distinctive is something that will make a lot of sense. And actually, when we understand it biblically, it's going to be one of the most important realities that we're actually going to talk about because it really does affect eternity. So we're going to begin by talking about the scriptural basis for the idea of an individual. Is this something that's even biblical to view ourselves as individuals? Or should we view ourselves just in terms of the whole or by groups of identities? It's something worth noting. And the first thing that we're going to talk about, we're not going to flip to Genesis 1. We'll come back to this passage later. But we do need to recognize that in Genesis chapter 1, we were human Humanity was created as individuals. Can I read you two verses from Genesis chapter 1? This is God's account where we read, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God created two individuals, male and female. We understand this is going to be Adam and Eve. Both of them are going to be infused with God's image. And we're actually going to talk about what that means a little bit later. There's a lot of general ideas about what it means to be an image bearer of God, but we're going to talk about it specifically involving the idea of being an individual. Adam was created from the dust of the ground, and what was Adam's task when he was created? Anybody? What was his job? Take care of the garden, right? Tend it, and taking care of the garden involved a couple different things. What were some of those tasks? Naming the animals, absolutely. Name the animals, and he gets busy doing that. What was that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And he really begins begins doing that. And then God looks down, and we have an interesting thing. And God said for the first time in our scriptures that something was not good. And what, what was not good about the situation? The man was alone. Right, So he made for him an helper, and Eve was created from Adam, and her task was helping him in his calling. She has a purpose, Adam has a purpose, and really from the beginning, we see a beautiful picture of helping one another, sacrificing with one another, working with one another, and the Bible goes a little bit more and says through their union, they actually become one flesh under God's authority. And what a perfect and beautiful picture this is. They were created as individuals, both were given a job to accomplish, and both are going to be held accountable. 
for their responsibility. Well, we're talking again, looking through the Bible, is there a basis for being and viewing ourselves as an individual? And what role does that individual have? Let's actually turn together here to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 14, and we're going to look in verse 5. So again, I'm trying to prove to you from Scripture, and maybe I didn't need to do this, but we're this far into it anyway. So Romans chapter 14, and uh, Paul is going to be discussing several things, and the context that we're going to plop down into in Romans chapter 14 is the the passage of scripture that talks about preferring the weaker brother or preferring one another above yourselves. And this is something that each of us is called to do, to love one another. But does someone want to read for us verse 5? One person esteems one day above another, and another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Yeah, and he's going to go on and he's going to use different examples for things that could cause us to be selfish and to prefer ourselves. But really that second phrase there is what we're going to hone in on for a moment. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. You know, a very clear application here for us, um, even from Edom. From, from Eden is the fact that man's responsibility is there for him to use wisdom, to use intelligence, to use his reasoning skills, the ability that God created him with to live rightly. And this is a biblical and divine expectation given to man from God that we are to be convinced of what is right in our own mind. Now, that does not mean that we get to decide for ourselves what is right or what is not right. So what is our basis for what's right and wrong? God's word, exactly. It's all going to tie in together. But we need to be utterly convinced about the truthfulness of a situation, the truthfulness of an idea, the, the rightness or wrongness of a situation. And this is more, that, that word there, be convinced in one's own mind. That is more than just the intellectual, academic acknowledgement of a situation. There are different words in our Bible that really address more of the, the true self. Earlier, I used the word soul for individual soul liberty. The New Testament uses a lot of the language about being convinced in one's mind. What's the Old Testament picture typically for the, the true self? Anybody know? Old Testament, it's used a lot as the idea of being convinced about something, the truthness of it. You have to be convinced in your, in your heart. That's, that's your Old Testament. It all is really meaning the same thing. Let me give you another passage. When Jesus is on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, he's talking to those two disciples. And listen to what Luke records here. Then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Yes, there was that intellectual acknowledgement, but there's something deeper going on there. Their hearts were touched by the truths and they were changed because of it. We see here that God's intention is for each person to be fully convinced about the way he should live and then to live in accordance with it. And thankfully, as we did bring up here, we're not left to our own devices to figure out what is right, what is wrong. God has given us everything that we need in the scriptures to properly discern the situations of life. And we're going to talk about that, that the spiritual person who is living the way that they're supposed to is going to be able to do that and will do that continually. And why? Why were we created as individuals? And why are we held to such a standard to make the right decision? What well, we see here, ultimately, we understand that each individual is going to be judged according to how they live their lives. We're actually going to go to both of these passages. So you're in Romans. Let's go over a couple books, a few pages in my Bible, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. When someone gets there, you can feel free to read about it for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Okay, so Paul really is addressing a few things here. We understand the judgment that's going to happen. Now, that Revelation passage that we're going to go to, that's probably a little bit more of what we naturally think of. And we think in terms of salvation and not being saved, right? Being a believer and not being a believer. But Paul here uh, used pretty specific language for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done. So this is something that's true about a believer and a non-believer alike. They will be judged. We will be judged for what we do. Now, part of the gospel, the beauty of the gospel, is that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, on what basis are we standing there? Exactly. We're standing there now because of what Christ has done, with, with who Christ is. You will be judged for who you are. And we do not want to be standing on our own merit when it comes to the day of reckoning at all. We will be judged, and we want to be judged because of who we are in Jesus Christ. But let's recognize that that's not the end of the story. Revelation 20. Let's, let's go to the last book of the Bible. Revelation 20, verse uh, 11 through 15. I'll handle this one for us, and then I'll have somebody jump in in the next passage. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Uh, we read here, Then I saw, this is John, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and Hades. You see, in my Bible, those are capitalized. We have personified them, right? Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Kind of a bummer on Wednesday, I apologize, but this is the reality of it. We will be judged as individuals. And Paul and John use very singular language there. The individual, the one, will be judged for what they have done. Um, there's, I think, a, f a few ways that we can take this scriptural basis for the idea of an individual, and I'd love maybe some perspective here. What are some ways that we could be tempted to try to minimize our individual responsibility before God? Any thoughts on that? What are some ways that we could be tempted to minimize our individual responsibility? And maybe why would we want to do that? Any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, <clears throat> perhaps someone would say, well, but I'm born again. I've been born again. Yeah. And they think that that relieves them from doing whatever they want, perhaps, or yeah. at least contains them. Yeah. Paul will give that argument, right? That we should sin that grace may abound all the more. Paul says, absolutely not. That is absolutely one way. It, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm saved, right? Absolutely, PJ. Well, just like Eve in the garden. Yeah. I mean, well, this somebody else did something that caused me to do this. I didn't have a choice. This isn't my fault. Yeah, I mean, seriously, within three seconds of that entire situation, I mean, everyone's pointing fingers at everybody. And as the joke goes, and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. I know. All right, that's enough. We're we're moving on. All right. Yes, there are many ways that we could be. T yes, Dylan. Please save me from my comments, yes. Oh, I was just going to say, um, just ignorance. Yeah. Okay. Um, biblical, um, just not understanding the illiteracy of the Bible, like what you just said there. The difference in that behemoth seat where you are judged and you get rewards, eternal rewards. Thinking that we're all just going to float on clouds. You know? Yeah. And intentional ignorance. And then oftentimes maybe just trying to do what's right, but not doing it the correct way. There is that standard that at the end of the day, maybe good intentions are not enough. I think that's spot on. 
there is some immediate application for us with this concept. As we continue into our discussion, we need to recognize that our eternal destiny is not based on our families. It's not based on our spouses. It's not based on our church that we're here together. We will be judged and held responsible for who we truly are. And as we alluded to, who we truly are, we want and desperately have to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. That is what that is our one hope for the individual soul and the freedom that we are called to in that. So before we continue on, I thought it would be appropriate to maybe kind of share what this is not, to kind of maybe get those out of our brain before we move on. Because again, there are some terms there that we need to understand properly and biblically. Number one, uh, the fact that you are free and have liberty in your individual soul does not mean that you are free to overcome sin's presence and power on your own. Right? We cannot just will ourselves to perfection um, as much as we may want to do that. Right, uh, a, a term that could be thrown here would be the, the freedom of our will. And I do believe that we have a free will and that you are free to choose according to your will. The problem with our will is that it is fallen and debased and corrupted by sin. I can no more conquer and overcome my sinful nature than I can will myself to fly like Superman or to turn into a lizard. My will is constructed and contained by things of how I'm created as well as the sin that I was conceived into. So no one's self-will, no one's self-determination can ever change the fact that we need a savior and who we are apart from that savior i direct you to romans chapter one for a really uplifting time there but you can see what it looks like to be enslaved in sin and what your condition is apart from christ so when we talk about we have liberty in our souls we're not talking about the fact that we can well save ourselves we're also not talking about the fact that we are free and I'm going to c- communicate what I mean by this, free to decide against God's will. We can sin, and we do that regularly. Uh, however, we are not free to change the consequences of that. We are not free to create the rules ourselves. We do sin, and we're going to talk about how God has allowed this and, and maybe even why God has allowed this to happen. I think the more we learn about our sin, the more we learn about our own soul, the more we just cry out to God, why, why would you even let us do this? Why don't you just make us to where we didn't even have this ability? And we'll talk about that in a moment. Though our sinful choices reflect the reality of our sinful natures, God is by no means obliged to abide by the rules that we would set. Though we choose to disobey God's word and his will, we are not free to avoid those consequences. And then maybe not just that liberty side, maybe we're tempted to misunderstand the individual side, especially coming off of our discussion of the priesthood of believers. We can look at so many of the blessings that God has given to us, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God's word, and we can maybe be tempted to want to live apart from God's people. Uh, We really highlight I'm free as an individual to live by uh, what I know to be true, what God's word says. But as we think about this idea, our own identity as being self-satisfied or content to live a lone Christian life alone by ourselves is not more weighty than the clear commands uh, from, from God's word specifically to be part of an active body to meet regularly together. Um, So we can't claim that our souls are free as an individual and say, so I'm going to do this myself. And we're going to talk about discernment this evening and how we should live from that freedom and liberty that we have. Um, But part of that discernment is looking at gray issues, right? Things that aren't specifically listed in scripture and faithfully applying truth to that. With something like this, there are so many black and white descriptions and commands in our scriptures that we don't even have to concern ourselves. We just simply obey. And one of those clear areas is the one another aspect of the body of Christ. So I wanted to start there, what it is not. And I'm going to have discussion questions in here throughout it, and we can talk to one another. But any responses to what we've discussed so far before we look at the flow of the biblical story with the individual? Any thoughts, something swirling in your brain so far that you want to get out? I got 
want to get to you, so good. All right, here we go. All right, the biblical flow of an individual. Yes. Number one, we were created in God's image. Can I remind you of that passage in Genesis 1.26? Very, very famous here. Um, there's, it's such a cool passage. Uh, in verse 26, we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. We've talked about this before, but who is God talking to in verse 26? Then God said, let us make man. Who's he talking to? He's talking to who? himself in one sense yes he's talking to the members of the trinity and yes all three are involved in creation colossians will tell us that jesus christ is the the creator so yes all three persons of the trinity have a role in the creation and god's decision was to make a specific creation different than all the rest this one creation really if we could say this the the ultimate creation that he makes and saves is, yes, mankind, humanity. And he says, I will make this individual with my image imbued in and through them. So does anyone have any thoughts or teachings or things that you've been taught about what it means to be created in God's image? Where are we at in our understanding generally of this? There's like a lot of right answers too, so don't feel like you're wrong here. There's like a ton of right answers. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think that the Holy Spirit within us, if we have the Holy Spirit within us, He is the one that works upon us to oh, yeah. be, uh, <laughs> to obey the Lord. Well, to be like God. Sure, to, certainly. To, to live the Word. Yeah. And He's the only one, I think, that, that can do that in my life. Oh, absolutely, yes. Thank goodness for the Holy Spirit and His ministry. We're actually going to get to that a little later. Yes, Dylan. The image of God. I was thinking about the, the love that we experience to, and it's a choice that we have. Yeah, the love for others. Actually, yeah, He made us that way to love oh, yeah. beautiful things and yes. pursue what is true and right. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, yes, that that desire to yes, that's going to be part of it. Any other thoughts in our minds? Dylan brought up the relational, maybe loving aspect of our nature. And yes, I think that would be very much exhibited by God's image. We see here in verse 26, let us make man. The members of the Trinity are working in perfect harmony with one another. Never is one of the persons of the Trinity arguing that they're not getting their way at all. They love one another. They submit to one another at different times. It's a completely perfect picture of love and fellowship. Any other things, though, that the image of God in man could mean or could apply to? Well, along that same line, you've got the, the will, being yeah. able to have yes. the will yes. to do and to choose love or to yes. choose. Yeah, yeah. self recognition, we could say there, self identification, understanding, and being able to rationalize far different than anything else in creation. We can be self aware, and I think part of that is that we can relate than to one another, and we can relate, ideally, to God. And that's going to be a huge aspect of it, BJ. Well, one thing that I heard before was just, so God's image, we are, we have our mind, our body, and our soul. And everyone has that. And another thing that is, like, unique to human beings and out of other creation is that we have the word and yeah. it's thought and it's written and it's spoken mm-hmm. and um, anyway yeah Again, a fascinating study about all the aspects of it. Why do I bring this up? We're talking about the individual responsibility we have. And the fact that we were created, our very selves, with God's image implanted in us. And from everything that we understand and recognize, this image was not lost as a result of the fall. It's not like pre-sin and post-sin. Now we don't have God's image. I believe we do. It is marred. But I do believe that every individual 
is an image bearer of God. Therefore, every life is valuable. Every man, woman, child has value because they are a person who bears God's image. And yes, we should live our lives in a certain way because of that. We have the right to love and to know God. We can live in harmony with other humans and creation. We can utilize our intelligence, our will, our emotion. And rightly used, what what does that do? That furthers Christ's kingdom in this world. It furthers God's purposes. And no clear image do we have in scriptures of the image of God being perfectly communicated then through whom? Jesus Jesus Christ. If you want to know what it looks like to perfectly display the image of God in man, you need to look no further than the God-man who perfectly manifests God to us. We were created in God's image, but heartbreakingly, tragically, we understand that we as an individual and as a people fell into sin and thereby have the consequences. Adam and Eve are going to throw away their position, their eternal standing with God when they disobeyed his command. So what was the sin of the garden? This could be a trick question. I'm just going to warn you there. What is the sin of the garden? Wanting to be God myself. I'm hearing a lot of things. Wanting to be God, pride, certainly. And that pride manifests maybe in what desire? What was that desire? Knowledge to be God. To be, yeah. Yeah, knowledge to be God, to be like God. Yeah, essentially, uh, yeah. We see what God's word was. We see his clear instructions. But no, we have a better plan. So actually, let's just move God over here, and we'll make that final decision. Um, I was watching an an interview where a Bible teacher was actually asked by a younger Bible student. And the question was, don't we think that God's retribution was a little harsh against Adam and Eve? And like you could have knocked the man over with a feather when he recovered himself and said, excuse me, and went on this beautiful, just diatribe of uh, do do you understand who god is and the sinning against the all holy all perfect all powerful god no eternal damnation is not light punishment for sinning against such a holy god and it's true we need to recognize because adam and eve certainly did the immediate consequence was what what was their immediate consequence they recognized that there was something wrong with them Right? Absolutely. We read here in verse 7 of Genesis 3. I'll read it for you. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And what, what we read next. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. One commentator commented on this situation, and, and he said, This shrinking from God remains part of our fallen condition. Is that not true? We shrink from the things of God. Our sinful nature hates righteousness. It hates holiness because we are still that sinful person that wants to remove God. We know that God's going to go on to pass judgment on the serpent. He's going to pass judgment on Eve. Finally, he's going to pass judgment on Adam. And he is going to hold them responsible for their actions. And ultimately, what is the final condemnation? You will surely die. Eternal separation. And I can only imagine what Adam and Eve are thinking in that moment when it just hits them of what have they done and God sends them out of the garden. And if that is, and that's just the first three chapters of our Bible. My goodness gracious. The Bible has a lot to communicate to us. But thank the Lord that in our flow of studying the individual, God has a provision of salvation and grace that he will make known to them. In the desperate hopelessness of that moment, God is going to show Mercy. Let me read you two more verses from chapter 3 there. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. 
We're actually going to turn together. We're in Revelation, I believe, if that's where I left you. Let's go back to the book of Ephesians very quickly. Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Ephesians chapter 1. There are four verses that we need to read here. God's promise of salvation and grace with our finite minds, again, Ephesians chapter 1, with our finite minds, we can get caught up in the story and we can almost be looking at this in real time. What's God going to do now? Adam and Eve have sinned. Does someone want to read for us verses 3 through verse 6? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ up to himself according to the kind of intention of his will. And then through six would be great. To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. As we read here in, Gen- in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul reveals something very fascinating about God's plan here. Uh, Adam and Eve's sin did not catch God off guard, right? It grieved him, broke his heart. I could say that from a human perspective, but it was never outside of his control ever outside of his control. God initiated his eternal plan of redemption in that moment. But as we read there, this has been his plan. He's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Before creation, God had a plan, a plan of redemption. And I understand the implications of what I'm saying with this. If God had a plan of redemption, God's plan included Adam and Eve's sin. It included the fall. It included the pain and the death and the suffering that sin has brought. And that's where we can ask ourselves the question, why would that be God's plan? Why would that be the way that he goes about interacting with his creation? And that is, in some senses, a safe question, a respectful question, but we need to understand that that is not the answer that we need. Though we may struggle to understand why he would do this, we rejoice in the reality that salvation has come to us through this situation. And we echo Paul's words in Romans 8, 1 through 2, that there is therefore, because of our salvation, because of Jesus Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Yes, we fell into sin. Yes, sin brings consequences. We sinned. God didn't make us sin. We are held responsible for that. But God had an eternal plan to bring salvation and grace. And with Paul's language there, now we have been given the spirit of freedom. Question for us here. So what do we do with that freedom? Another way to ask it would be, how then should we live? Immediate reactions to that? What do we do with it? What are we called to do with it? Live a holy life. Live a holy life. Beautifully said. Anything else? Deny ourselves. Yeah. Deny ourselves, take up our cross, follow him. Anything else? Look back in a restored relationship that doesn't hide from God. Yeah. yeah. Look at what was lost in creation, that shirking from God, and seek to live a life that is ever present with him in relational truth. It's so true. The biblical flow of the individual at first appears perfect falls into hopeless sin, but the individual is and can be redeemed because of Jesus Christ. And we continue on. Now, with that, how then shall we live? The question that is there for us, we're going to park now in a passage of Scripture and give about three things that the spiritual individual does. So this is an individual who has been redeemed, and this is what they do. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You should be in Ephesians. Let's go back a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to look at a couple of these verses, um, one at a time. Again, Paul here is talking about his testimony with the Corinthian church, talking about wisdom that comes from the Spirit of God. And first of all, we are going to recognize here that 
The spiritual, the spiritual individual faithfully interprets spiritual truths. Does someone want to read uh, verse 11 and 12 for me from chapter 2? For who among men knows the thoughts of a man, except a man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God, except the spirit of God. Right, and we'll, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, 12. Go as well as 12. And we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Appreciate you saying that. So, yes, uh, we can understand Paul's immediate thing here. He's saying there in verse 11, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person? Again, we're all sitting here this evening. I trust that we're paying attention. I trust that you're engaged with this. But you could be thinking about anything. Really, at this moment, I have no idea. Why? Because nobody knows our thoughts other than ourselves. That's exactly Paul's argument here. Who can know the spirit or the person's thoughts except that individual himself? Well... He says, so too with God. No one can understand the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And again, this Spirit there, I have it capitalized, referring there to the Holy Spirit. We understand that no one can understand God's word uh, or God's will apart from that revelation. So too, we recognize that the Holy Spirit knows the very mind of God. And why does the Holy Spirit know the very mind of God? Because he is very God himself. Therefore, we can have confidence that what has been revealed by the Spirit, Peter will say that, Holy men, as they were born along by the Holy Spirit, what was brought to them can be rightly understood as being the intention of God himself. And when we read the scriptures, it's not just that the Holy Spirit delivered it to us, but in verse 12 at the very end, that we read there, the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Actually, the Holy Spirit also illumines the truths of Scripture. This is how someone who is vehemently against the things of God can read the Bible, and it doesn't do anything. Is it because they don't understand the words? Of course not. There is a spiritual reality behind the things of God. And we're going to talk about this because... The one who is spiritually minded, the spiritual individual, faithfully interprets, meaning that we understand the Bible as it was meant to be understood. And praise the Lord that it is meant to be understood. We do not need to come to our scriptures and immediately always ask ourselves the question, what is the hidden truth in this passage? What is the underlying thing that unless somebody went to some type of 12-year seminary degree are going to understand? No, the Bible is clearly understood and the Spirit it makes it come alive to us and what do we do with it well we embrace it we live it but secondly we readily impart spiritual truths to others somebody take verse 13 for me these things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches but which the holy spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual Exactly, Paul's words there for us. And we impart then in words that aren't brought about by human wisdom. Uh, Bunyan would say that they are not brought about by the, the worldly wise man of this age, knowing that we have the ability to accurately understand God's words, we then have the obligation to accept those truths and share them with others. And again, Paul's language here is not directed in this context. This is not directed just to pastors. This is not just directed to some spiritual elite in the church. He's talking to faithful believers in in Corinth who, yes, had a lot of issues themselves. But he says, and we impart them in words, not by human wisdom. He's talking to them. We all have received this as individuals. We are called to be sharing these truths But what's interesting here is at the end of verse 13, he he does give a qualification. What is the qualification at the end of verse 13 to the audience? Who's going to receive it? Dylan's exactly right on there. To those who are spiritual. 
Okay, so someone t- tell me what that means. We're talking about imparting spiritual truths. Paul goes on to say, we don't impart them by human wisdom, but we interpret spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So who, are, who is that? Believers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, and this one is going to be something that we sort of need to pause here for a moment. Imparting spiritual truth, we call it a lot of different things. We call it giving wisdom. We call it sharing biblical advice. We, we could call it counseling, a situation. And let's just give a, really, a real situation. You have someone come to you, and they are really struggling because financially they're making a lot of poor decisions in their lives. Now, you know this individual is not a Christian. You can go to practical biblical advice about Sure, preferring one another, like in Romans 14, living your life, being, bringing proper order to your lives. But when Paul's talking here in 1 Corinthians 2, he's going to say that that is not going to work. You, you are not able to impart those truths. And we can sort of put the rubber to the road, really. I can't share someone, if they're going through a marriage struggle, even if they're not a Christian, that you should love your wife, that you should lead your family, you should love your husband and seek to serve him. What do you mean I can't give someone who's unsaved that type of wisdom? Paul's saying here, you can't. You, you can't give that type of spiritual advice to someone who's not spiritual, why? I don't understand it. I can understand it, and let's just... Wisdom. They don't have the wisdom to... Yeah. At the end of the day, who's on the throne of their heart? Them, themselves. So the basis of biblical truth is the fact that we are submitting to God's way and the way that God has c- commanded us to live. And yes, we understand that I need to sacrifice because I'm not the center of the universe, and I need to love somebody. I need to order my finances. Why? Because God's kingdom is at stake here, and I can't just spend money on whatever I want. That's a selfish way to live. And I'm not saying that the image of God in man doesn't graciously by God limit people's sin, limit the consequences of people's sin, but if you are trying to immediately jump into counseling somebody who is not a believer, well, what's Paul say here? This isn't for me. Let's look at verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. You have that friend, that coworker who's going through a marriage crisis. You know he's not a believer. What is step one in counseling that individual? Certainly, but if it's a spiritual example, it's, that's, that's going to be folly to him. What is step one? Evangelize. Witness to that individual. And... It's, it's a wrong way to say it, to quote-unquote get them saved. That is a wrong way for me to say that. But if they're not responding to truth, you giving them all the biblical wisdom about how a proper marriage and a proper family should go is not going to do anything. Especially if they go, oh, this is great. Hey, this worked. All right, I'm good now. And then you've actually maybe given them some of the advantages of being a Christian. Or you've welcomed them into some of the benefits without actually them confessing their sins and being actually regenerate. We readily impart spiritual truths, but we do it to those who are spiritually minded. And if not, we implore them to come to Christ. We witness, we evangelize to them. And when that, we can see that happens, then they are in the position to what? To wisely make decisions about life. I read verse 14. Does someone want to read verse 15? But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Yeah, so Paul sort of says a weird phrase there. The spiritual person judges all things, but he himself uh, to be judged by no one. And really, if we put that in context with the natural man in verse 14, Paul's saying here, look, you who are spiritual, you who have spiritual insight, no one who is outside of the body of Christ is going to be able to look at look at you and judge you as if you don't have the final answer. Their wisdom, be it whatever worldly wisdom, is never going to bring you to being judged, ergo to prove you wrong in the way that you are living your life. Why? Because it is the spiritual man who rightly judges life, who rightly discerns 
what is truth. This is where the rubber, again, meets the road. And this should not fill one with pride, but a spiritually influenced confidence. Why should we not be pride-filled and full of pride? Because we are able to spiritually discern things. Well, because the confidence is not in ourselves. It's not in our ability to understand or to figure things out. We recognize, going back to that flow of the biblical flow of the individual, we know who we are. We know what our sin has done for us. It is God's will for us to grow in our discernment as we navigate life's challenges according to his word and according to his ways. And there are different ways that we can go about developing that spiritual discernment. What are some of those ways? Yeah, he took the good one. He took the easy one, everybody. Now you're going to have to talk about it. Yes, reading scriptures. Absolutely. Anything else? Pray consistently for wisdom. Praying consistently for wisdom. Absolutely. Getting good counsel yes. from other believers. Certainly. Yes. Receiving that truth. Absolutely. That's what I said. Yes. Yeah. 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 Listening to others. Anything else? Anybody very hands-on in how you are learning? Any uh, hands-on learners here? You actually practice by actually going about and discerning situations and actually making those decisions and applying what we're reading, applying what we're praying for, and actually having the confidence that the Spirit of God is right and that we don't have to be crippled by the fear of the unknown. No, we have everything we need. We have the Spirit. We have His Word. We have prayer. We have His promise that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And therefore, we can go and do it and live correctly. And why is this ultimately so important? Why should we focus and why does the Baptist distinctive focus on the fact that the individual soul has a certain amount of liberty? And why should that have a role to play? And by liberty there, I mean the freedom to properly discern these things, to properly make biblical decisions, to properly make biblical choices. Well, this is where we're going to land the plane here uh, because we will be held responsible for God by what we do. And there are two areas that we will be held responsible. First of all, we will be held responsible for knowing God. And yes, we know him through his word primarily. We marvel at the beauty of his creation. We recognize that his image is in us, in those around us, that enables us to love, that enables us to desire to have a relationship with him. We affirm that God has created us in his image. And we know God because he has personally revealed himself to us. If God has made himself known to us, he, uh, we are obligated to accept that. Listen to Ezekiel's words. Again, this is God's words recorded by the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 11. God says this, And I will give them one heart, and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. Yes, that's an Old Testament passage prophesying the ultimate reality of what the people of God were called to. Paul says, though, the same thing here in in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He lets them know, this Corinthian church, in verse 2, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So do, do we know him? Do we really know God? Do we know him as he's revealed himself through his word? We cannot strive, as Adam and Eve did, to make a God in our own image, right? He's created us in his, and he gets to set the playing rules. We must know him according to truth, And why is it so important to know him? Because we are also responsible to obey him. We will be held accountable eternally for how we respond to the revealed God of creation. 
And again, we can't blame him. We can't blame others based on our own understanding of what's fair and what's not fair in this life. We must recognize who he is, admit our sin, and fall upon the grace and the mercy of God. Listen to the writer of Hebrews imploring his audience in verse 11 of chapter 4. He says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eye of him whom we must give account. So this is a very weighty distinctive here. We should leave here knowing, wow, what have we been called to? We're not called to do whatever we want. We have been set free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But we are now free to serve him. We are free to live according to his plan for our lives. And how do we do this practically? I have three questions for us as we conclude this evening. Number one, do we spiritually discern biblical truth? And actively work to make changes in our lives. You know, that's, that's, that's real. That is where it's difficult. We read God's word. We assess our own lives. And we know, wow, I see God said this. And I know me. And I know I struggle to do that. Am I actively working to make those changes? It's not in and of us. But we're held responsible. And we've been given everything we need to change. So are we doing it? Are we trusting God? Falling on his grace? Secondly, Do we welcome others? I think BJ brought this up. Do do we welcome welcome others into that role of assessment and counsel? There is strength in numbers, and there is a family atmosphere in God's people. Do you have someone in your life who can know you well enough, and you know them well enough, that they can pull you aside and share truth with you? Are we doing that for others? That, that That takes relationship. That takes trust. That takes loving one another. But that is a a means of grace that God has given us. And finally, do we use our liberty to prefer one another through service and sacrifice? That's what Paul said in Romans 14 as, as we began, being convinced in your own mind of what is right. Why? So that we can love and prefer one another. As we conclude this evening, rather than shirking those responsibilities, and I understand the weight of this is now, wow, God's put a lot of responsibility on me. You know, I thought I could just say, let go and let God, right? No, no, no. No, we are held responsible for how we respond to these amazing truths. So let's not let anxiety, let's not let a spirit of fear hold us back. Let us rejoice in our salvation and claim the promises of God of what? That he offers daily grace and his faithfulness is new every morning. Why? Because it was provided through Jesus Christ. And if we can have confidence in him, we can have confidence in what he has called us and empowered us to do. As we conclude, any final comments for us? Individual soul liberty. Anything on your heart that you need to get out? The whole week. Next time. Um, a tough question. I'll play for you. How about, I mean, I'm not trying to put attention on other people, but how about people you know that really, like you, you gave the, the example of someone that is lost, but that soul liberty, people that wake up at 5 a.m., open their Bible. Spend time talking to God in prayer. They read it, they know it, they go to churches, but the church is kind of known by those who can discern that it's a more of a false teaching. They they read the word, but they don't it's like they don't ever really quite understand understand it. Like so what do you think's happening with them? Like that that are there, is their soul taking a liberty to follow a false teaching to the point where the Spirit is not even revealing the truth that's in here because they can't see it. Right. Yeah, I mean, the example there was given to someone who's in a church that we know is not doing what's right or certainly errant in some doctrine or something that's wrong. They're reading their Bible. They're trying to love the Lord their God. But why are they there still? Why aren't they making that change? I think, number one, uh, we can't undersell the value of a, 
a healthy church. I mean, I think that that is a grace that we've been given. Um, a lot of it is community. And yes, we are called to be free and we have that responsibility. And I would pray that that individual, whomever he or she may be, yes, that the spirit would open their eyes and give them the confidence. Sometimes that's it. You are comfortable where you're at. You can give into a lot of fear of man's you can convince yourself of a lot of things i couldn't go ask the pastor why we do that because he knows so much more than i do i'm just gonna sit back and just sort of observe um but yes that 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 spirit of fear i think really will hold a lot of christians back another part would just be maybe in ignorance right not knowing uh what the bible says getting into the word um but in that situation it's 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 loving that person enough to point them to the truth it's praying that the lord would illumine their minds that they would respond in obedience uh yes ma'am well that kind of makes me think of the illustration with the rich young ruler yeah. you know he mm-hmm. is following all the ten commandments and a leader in the community and whatnot, but there is that one thing that he is not willing to give over to the Lord. And I mean, I know in my own life, you know, for years, the Lord is dealing with me listening to some things, you know. But so, you know, he, I would say he's a brother and sister in Christ, and like Jesus put his finger on the rich young ruler and said, This is what it is. Yeah. You know, the Lord's going to be doing that to someone that belongs to him. Certainly. And they're either going to, you know, push it, down, push it to the side or they're going to do what's right. Yeah. Yeah, and Lord willing, when they are confronted with that truth, they would respond correctly. Amen. Yes, ma'am. It took me to listen to hundreds of uh, 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 sermons um, to get that. I need to obey God, have to obey God, the church needs to obey God, the members of the church need to obey God. And uh, and that led me into find, finding a church and members and individuals that do that, um, that can also be mentors to me yes. as being a uh, newer, uh, uh, born again believer. Sure. So it took a lot of good preaching. We thank the Lord that he is gracious, that he is long-suffering, he is patient toward us. And those, as John 10 tells us, those whom the Father has given to Christ, no one can pluck them out of his hands. And we can be confirmed and assured that he who began a good work in us will bring it to the day, to completion at the day of Christ. So let's, let's close in prayer, and we will continue conversations after that. Father, thank you for a passage of scriptures that we were able to look at. Thank you that you do save us as individuals. Thank you that you have given each of us a role. None of us is looked over or is not as useful as another. Father, you've empowered us, you've enabled us, you have given us skills and mindsets and and different abilities, Lord, to serve you, to serve one another. I pray that we would be a church that looks for ways to use those gifts, that has confidence in the Spirit of God, in Jesus Christ and the Father, who has saved us and empowered us to accomplish His will. I thank you that we are set free now. No longer are we under the bondage of sin and the chains of darkness. We have been set free to serve a new master, a perfect master, and a perfect Savior. So we thank you for Jesus, and it's in His name we pray. Amen.